50% of attendees are female in this room. And uh, at least one LGBT, right? So following, we are talking about how can CV Tech reach more people and how we be more inclusive, not only gender, but uh, oh. So, uh, um, okay. I don't have a joke anymore, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's welcome our panelists and uh, our uh, Jima is a moderator. Okay, welcome them. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being here still. Um, so let me introduce this panel. Um, so recent research into civic technologies has suggested that some civic tech tools may actually empower the already empowered. So instead of giving a voice to underrepresented and marginalized groups, um, as it originally hoped for, it's actually giving power to potentially those people that already have quite a lot of it anyway. So our objective with this uh, time in the panel uh, discussion today is to dis discuss the significance of this for the civic technology uh, sector and to discuss ways to tackle this trend. So we'll hear from all of our panelists here um, and thank you very much for joining us. So let me introduce everyone. Um, so first at the end here, we have Nanjira Sambuli. Uh, she's the Digital e Equality Advocacy Manager at the Web Foundation. And then we have James Powell, um, Global Lead of the U Report, um, well, U Report at UNICEF. Um, and then we have um, Oriane Ledois. She's um, Director of the Digital Society Programme at the French Digital Agency. Um, and finally, we have Lisa Garcia, who's the Executive Director of the Foundation for Media Alternatives based in the Philippines. Um, so I'd like to kick off um, with getting everyone's perspectives on the following. So do you think empowering the already empowered is a concern for civic technology? And if so, should civic tech projects make a concerted effort to broaden their user bases? Um, so I'll, I'll kick off at the end um, here and please use the microphone with Nanjira's thoughts on this. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. So um, I've been thinking a lot about that question because on one hand, it sounds a bit like a paradox in itself, but um, I think there's nothing fundamentally wrong with empowering the already empowered, but it just hasn't, it, it shouldn't stop there. And that's where the concern factor comes in on two levels. One, it can become very easy to convene time and again and, and you know, sort of like pander to the fact that yes, we're not reaching those who should be reached, let's have fail fares around that and create a whole economy around it. But at the same time, it's not unique to civic tech alone. Technology and its benefits are going primarily to the elite, to the connected in any particular society. Now the question to all of us is how do we start addressing that to make sure that it is more inclusive and not a zero-sum game? Because sometimes it does feel like with how the discourses go, then it means let's forget those who are already connected altogether and jump and find all these people who are not connected and then we start sort of like fetishizing that unconnectedness and trying to create all these ideas of how we can go and observe these people. They're now a phenomenon we must observe and figure out how to engage. So um, in and of itself, it's good that it's empowering the already empowered. The question is, in that empowerment, are they also setting a roadmap that will make it desirable for those who are not yet connected to see that this is possible? So if we say we have tools to uh, monitor parliamentary progress, for instance, if I see that, um, say, I come from a context where maybe I, I live in an urban area, but I do have family in the rural areas. If I go back and we're talking about the political scenario, I'm in Kenya, I'm from Kenya rather, and right now that's all we're talking about. But if I'm able to go back to say my relatives in the village and talk about, oh yeah, well, I was able to put my member of parliament or my local county representative to account using this platform, then they start seeing that this sort of, I don't want to call it a trickle down effect, but they, it starts showing what's possible based on those who are already connected and already empowered. Um, and people start also maybe creating organic demand for what they want based on the same pr uh, portal. So I'll leave it for there for now. Okay. Hey. 
Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I think um, it's not a black and white empowered versus unempowered issue. I think um, what, what you're also potentially saying is that a lot of the civic technology uh, attracts um, a lot of guys um, and they might be more wealthy than your average uh, citizen, depending on what the projects are you're looking at. I mean, from our perspective at um, UNICEF and the Innovation Centre, uh, we have a various different projects that are there to try and make sure that people can uh, speak out, express themselves and be heard. Um, and you can see those similar trends. Um, our our com comedian friend said that as 40% of the people in this room are, are women, and there's actually 40% of the people in our project are, are women, but that is not something that gets clapped. <laughs> Um, because you're obviously striving to have something that's more equal. It's, uh, you're trying to reach 50. Now, the point is, is that we know. We know um, where our weaknesses are um, because we're constantly monitoring and tracking them through real-time data. So if you're able to build that into whatever your projects are, you can start seeing your gaps pretty quickly. Um, when we started one of our projects in Uganda, we could see we knew that from a UNICEF perspective we had... Um, a priority in the north. They were the poorest districts. We knew that, and our country program had a big focus there. So we tried to reach more people there in our tech projects as well, which we did. But then we were, we were open to criticism for not including other parts of the country. Um, so you have to try and take a fair, balanced, and rational approach, but most importantly, be able to track where your gaps are. So going back to the example of uh, access, if you look at gender, that's what's one area of priority. Um, we also look at age. You know, from UNICEF, we strongly believe that young people are left out of a lot of decision-making processes and they shouldn't be. Um, and when you talk about empowered and empowered the empowering, I, I think young people, I, I, it's not black and white, I think it's almost a trajectory, it's a spectrum. And, and the, um, the more tools you can put in place and you're essentially just opening a door but if you can make it accessible by um, targeting effectively, uh, then you can fill those gaps. Okay, great, thank you. Um, hopefully that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I, I'd like to, to start, f um, sorry for the accent, I'm, I'm French, so uh, we don't uh, <laughs> know how to speak English. Um, I, I'm just, I, I just want to, start uh, with um, explaining uh, from which per perspective I'm, I'm talking. Um, as I, 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 um, I am the director of uh, Société Numérique, which means Digital Society, and it's a, a French tax task force uh, built by the government uh, to, uh, to work on um, building a, a digital society that is innovative and inclusive, the two, the two things working together. Uh, and so we, we really um, work on uh, digital empowerment uh, and, and we, we especially work with um, digital literacy uh, stakeholders such as uh, libraries, uh, internet access point and uh, uh, people who really uh, make a literacy program for people. So uh, concerning civic tech, we, we, we are working um, to connect digital liter literacy initiatives with civic tech uh, activists because we, we, one of the main uh, challenge we are facing is that we underestimate digital divide in France. Uh, also there is, a, there is a big one and there is also uh, in fact gender gap, income gap uh, concerning digital appropriation. So we are really working on uh, connecting uh, the two worlds. Uh, we have some uh, experiment, uh, experiment uh, that we uh, are going through and uh, that we, we, uh, we will present uh, tomorrow. Um, and we, we think that um, civic tech without digital inclusion, without digital li literacy for everyone is, is not a, a force of empowerment uh, and social change. Um, so, so one one of uh, one of the things we we are doing to connect is that first we we monitor uh, digital divide to help civic tech activists having uh, data and uh, resources to to tackle uh, the, the 
the, the issue. And, and second, we uh, also use civic tech tools to implement our action to, uh, to help uh, people who are working with, uh, such as librarians and, and, uh, and uh, internet access points, extra. Uh, so, so, that, so that they can uh, use civic tech tools and uh, and promote them uh, through uh, through their their initiatives and their their uh, workshop they are they are they are they are doing. Thank you. First of all, uh, before I begin, um, uh, I would like to say that I like the gender balance in this panel. <laughs> It's just that I was reminded I was um, I attended the opening session and you had more and I was looking at the stage and you had the males there. It was majority of male who were on stage and the women were just ushering them to go on stage and I didn't like that. So anyway, so yeah, so I come from the Philippines and and so my perspective would be more on that. So anyway, we've been for for um, recently we've been looking at. Um, uh, ICT mediated structures for citizen engagement and also we recently developed an index to look into open e-governance. So we've been looking into um, different platforms, the e-services provided by government, um, the platforms developed by um, civil society which uh, demand for transparency and accountability of government. And, and you find a lot of uh, good um, uh, technology here, good applications and platforms. But who are actually using these platforms that are being developed? Of course, in, in, in a country like the Philippines where internet penetration is at like about 56%. So um, there is um, more than, uh, a little less than uh, uh, half of the population are not um, included. So they don't even know what these um, technologies are they're not even aware of this. Uh, perhaps it's not even relevant to them. So I think we should also question, um, um, are, are they informed even that this exists? And when you have a country, a developing country, where basic needs should be um, addressed first, so you don't expect actually uh, this, uh, uh, most of the people to, to, to start uh, engaging using this uh, civic tech because they would rather um, uh, uh, work on, on, on their basic needs rather than this. So, um, yeah, of course, um, the empowered are uh, empowered here. Those who are connected, those who have access, they're the ones using these technologies. But, uh, well, if, but they, they also have the responsibility. They can also, you know, um, uh, help other sectors realize what they're missing and, 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 and uh, work with them. And also, um, let us also, when, um, I'd just like to say that when, when companies or organizations develop technologies, uh, they should also look at the, the marginalized sectors, the women, uh, uh, persons with disabilities, um, um, the IPs, um, and then, uh, let's, in as much as when we organize, for instance, activities or, or, or workshops, usually we conduct training needs analysis. So we should also do survey first before developing these technologies. Like, what do they actually need? Talk to these people, to, talk to the community, so to find out what they actually need and what would work for them and what they would use. Capacitate them as well. Okay, thanks. Oh, this one works. <laughs> um, okay, brilliant. Thank you for those perspectives. Um, so, I mean, what I'd really like to hear from the panelists is, have you seen, what successful ways have you seen of broadening user bases? So, I mean, for example, James, you were saying you were targeting the North. What, what were you actually doing to target those people? Like, and, you know, other examples of, I know, Oriane, you've worked on a voucher scheme um, to uh, help people get online and things like that. So it'd be really nice to hear if you yeah, have practical examples of how you, you know, you've realised that a certain sector of society is not getting the benefit from using a particular civic tech tool or, or project and you want to reach out to that community. What, what examples of successful actions have you seen? Thanks. Um, so with our projects, we, we mobilise people in a number of ways. So we start off with we generally start with a mass approach. So who are the people that you can pick up through 
uh, your typical awareness channels, if you're in sub-Saharan Africa radio, um, if you're in Latin America or Southeast Asia through digital channels, who are the people you can attract? Um, we make uh, our platforms as open as possible um, by including uh, as many channels as possible to get to them. So today you can connect through SMS, which is still core uh, in certain parts of the world for us, um, to be able to connect with people. And then we also have uh, Facebook Messenger channels and Viber, par a partnership with Fiber, a uh, number of different technical private companies. Um, and then finally, um, once you have all of that and you start seeing where your gaps are, we physically go there. So we will, um, in, in that Uganda example, for example, we can see where we're not uh, picking people up, where the radio coverage or the mass awareness techniques have not uh, got to people, um, they haven't got involved. Uh, we'll look at those spots and we'll, we'll go there with our partners. We have a global partnership with the Girl Guides um, who are great at that. Um, they have 10 million members worldwide, and they will go uh, deep into you know, rural areas. Um, they'll even um, be teaching people how to SMS. So you can't take for granted that people, even if the equipment is already in the community, which it has to be, right, you can't afford to go around giving everyone a mobile phone. Um, but using equipment that's already in the community and then making sure that the knowledge is there to use it effectively um, is something that we've been able to support. Private sector um, often gets behind that because they figure that if you're teaching people um, how to use uh, different platforms, it will benefit them in the long term eventually anyway because one day those people will be using that for commercial purposes. Um, so yeah, physically going there. And just to comment on the, the speakers at the opening ceremony, I, I was speaking at um, a Girl Guides event, and I was the only guy. <laughs> so I guess what goes around. Um, but yeah, I think that you know, um, sometimes you need a network, under identify big networks like the guides to mobilize and, and physically go to places. Um, and then there's a few other word of mouth um, tactics as well. Final example, in Pakistan, where we find it really hard to um, reach uh, women and girls. We've got a big skew towards men um, in our project there. Um, what we do is we have a um, referral system in place. So um, people that are kind of like ambassadors, they're really active within the program, we can identify them. And we can say, right, these 20 people, they look like they're super interested in this issue, in this project. Um, we can give them access to additional resources. So we do, uh, for example, last year, um, for the people that recruited the most girls, they could go to a, a it was a, a conference on human rights in Islamabad, and we'd cover the travel. And what they had to do was recruit the most amount of girls in their, in their town. And um, one person recruited over 700 people, <laughs> just one person credited to that code. Not everybody did that. But um, the, there's, there's really basic incentives you can put in place to mobilize informal social networks as well. Yeah. Um, in France, we, we have some, uh, I, I said that we have a, a, an important, a huge um, digital device concerning uh, digital literacy. Uh, we, we have approximately 20 percent of French people who don't feel at ease uh, to use the internet and uh, we, we made a survey on uh, on digital empowerment and that showed us that um, approximately 90 91 percent of uh, French people do not consider uh, digital tools as uh, empowering tool and uh, as a, a, a political uh, useful tool so we we try to uh, find a solution to make people um, go to training uh, li digital literacy uh, program uh, training center um, and to to uh, make the this program uh, free for people um, so we create um, uh, this kind of a voucher that um, is a, f a physical uh, thing a tangible uh, conflict concrete thing that we gave people. And uh, with this voucher, uh, French people can go to uh, 
to a, a training program can uh, can uh, be um, trained with uh, digital skills with basic digital skills so that they can uh, be uh, less uh, more confident using uh, using uh, digital tools using the internet and um, we, we made the, the this voucher funded by ev every organization who has, uh, which has um, interest in uh, is what you, what you say with the uh, private sector. Uh, we made uh, we made we made uh, this fund um, we made this voucher fund by every uh, organization who, who, uh, which have uh, interest in uh, in. Uh, in equipping people with uh, digital uh, digital basic skills such as administration, uh, local governments, but also uh, private uh, companies, and so that the, it 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 helps us uh, found a training program and it gives people a solution to to be trained uh, for free. So uh, it is also a, a kind of civic tech uh, tool uh, this voucher because there there is a data platform. Uh, Behind this, and we we can uh, collect data to see which program is uh, is really uh, used and uh, what we have to to promote. So that that is a uh, first. Uh, we we experiment uh, this uh, this voucher uh, three months ago, and we wanted to deploy it uh, nationwide. Okay, it's a really cool um, idea for uh, tackling di digital exclusion. Um, so, uh, Nanjiro, do you, do you have any examples of? Uh, um, just based on a couple of examples I've come across, just some key lessons I've learned is also um, really understanding what's appropriate technology to use as well. Um, for example, um, there is in the northern, actually the southeastern parts of Kenya, there are communities there that have um, had histories of misinformation, not to use fake news, but misinformation, distrust between two communities. And so for a team that wanted to work on how technology could help with misinformation there, um, one of the first things they had to do is actually deploy their team to actually be with that community for a long period of time to establish trust and to truly understand. On one hand, yes, you sort of want to set it up as a quick a survey type of thing or um, a, a report, even nicer if we could, as techies, we like to just read a report, build upon that, hack it, and build something. But they had to start with the truly analog stuff, truly understand that community and the two dynamics um, and perspectives they're coming from. And then better understand the kind of technologies that were available, which in this case was a mobile phone perhaps for every sort of like village. And the fact that it was only after, say, for instance, 50 years of independence in Kenya that they were getting their own community radio station. And so it was to truly map out what was available and appropriate and people's perceptions of technology. Because on one hand, you find that um, even when we talk about those who are not included, there's also the issue of agency, why they don't, also people don't want to be included. If they feel it's a tool for surveillance, if they feel it's a tool to be tracked, those are all factors you have to understand and you have to buy yourself time. So that has been a very important lesson. And last but not least is also that, especially for those of us who come from parts of the world that are so researched and so deployed upon stuff, people are growing increasingly cynical. And so you have to be able to, 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 to see that when you go in. I remember actually speaking of Uganda, um, some techies and communities, they're saying, well, we're over research. We're like the guinea pig of the world, you know? And a lot of these things are framed as events. And can you imagine in the event of you going with your nice idea and then it doesn't launch and then your neighbor next door comes in the following day, those communities, there's an impact that's left behind. So I've learned that it's very, very important to also understand who came before you and what damage or uh, yeah, maybe what damage did they do? <laughs> because you have to apologize on behalf of everyone and start building that trust again. It's just what it is. And we're, as techies, sometimes we're not prone to that. You sort of just want to go deploy an app and that kind of thing. That empathy is really, really important, especially with communities that are so researched and it's almost always like a little pilot project, pilot capitals of the world. So these are all factors that may not necessarily um, fit within the typical idea of how we talk about this stuff, but it's stuff that I've come to really appreciate as very, very important, especially if somebody else, even if you don't have the funding or support to keep this thing going. I remember with this particular community, again, they said, well, in the event you guys leave, 
we need a sort of like way that to know that your your presence here counted for something. Uh, interestingly, what that community wanted was a way to resource to sort of like pull together funds so they could have their own empowering economic activities. So they're like, well, whatever you're telling us is nice, yeah. What we want is to be able to give uh, to to rent out tents and chairs for all these people uh, coming to campaign and that kind of thing. And that was really interesting. So if you actually immerse yourself into these communities, if you buy yourself time, you'll also better understand how they see it as a quid pro quo, so that you know you can also bring in, who can you bring into the sort of like partnership to help figure out other things that don't necessarily fit within the tech. So I hope that's also just as useful as the tech apl applications, yeah. Okay, um, would you like to say something on, on examples of um, broadening user bases that you've seen? Uh, um, we're, we're part of the um, Take Back the Technology campaign. And, and, and part of that is um, uh, there was one portion in, in that campaign where um, uh, a reporting platform for reporting um, violence, uh, online violence against women was developed. And several countries, in, including the Philippines, were doing that. Um, Initially, when, when we were looking at, at reports coming in, there were very few um, reports coming in um, in the platform. We, it was available online. Uh, they can send through email, and then it was also connected through uh, frontline SMS. But we weren't getting a lot of reports. So we tried to analyze um, what was wrong. And then, of course, um, aside from the fact that um, perhaps others do not want to report issues concerning um, violence against women, it was also the lack of know-how on how to report. Um, actually, we're engaging with a community of urban poor women, and they are interested. Uh, they have told us about their um, um, uh, experiences of, of, be, uh, of uh, online harassment, but they don't report it. Then when we were telling them about um, the platform, they said that they don't know how to report it. So one of the projects that we're doing with them right now is to conduct a basic digital literacy with them. They, can't ev they don't even know how to put up their own email account. So we're starting with the very basic. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, obviously, everything that you guys have said really emphasizes how important you know, participatory design of civic technology tools is. Um, and obviously that can be a real key factor in success of these tools. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience? I'll try to include you at this point. Um, do we have a roaming mic? Oh, we've got all the mics here. Thanks, MG. So this is also related to the experience that we were speaking about. While we did a civic tech uh, project which was associated in India, the main criticism is that, as they said, uh, the first stone they try to, uh, you know, um, throw at uh, civic tech activists is you are elitist. Mm -hmm. You don't care about 80% of the population who do not have access to uh, smartphones or 80% of the population do not have access to internet. So what are you doing? We should get uh, disheartened about... Uh, such criticism. Basically, when we are building a product, we need to check it out whether it is working properly. We should be aware of these, uh, uh, what do you say, um, as to how to reach it to a larger audience. What we did was we uh, put out the same messages in various languages. We put it out in SMS. We put it out, uh, sort of that people using other languages could access the site other than English. Uh, SMSs in other languages, but you know one has to be very clear as to where this criticism is coming from. It could be coming from very, very, very motivated quarters, you know, to uh, basically demean or defame a civic tech activity. Okay, important point. Um, has anyone else got any questions for the panelists? Oh, oh, there's one at the front there. Well, everyone else had a chance, didn't they? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things in my society that we've started experimenting with is kind of trying to nudge people into, into doing something once they're actually on the site. Um, so not necessarily 
reaching out to, to bring the new people onto the site, but there might actually be people on the site already that for some reason or other don't actually then kind of go that extra final mile and actually make a request or a report or, or, or whatever. Um, to what extent is that a useful thing, do you think? Do you think that's, that's something that we should actually morally be doing? You know, I, I suppose we kind of think, well, maybe they just need a bit more encouragement or maybe it just needs to be easier or we need to put this button in a different place. But should we actually be making a lot of effort to, to kind of design to, to do that? Or are we artificially nudging people into participating where they might actually not want to? <laughs> I'll have, have a go at that. <laughs> um, I think that you do need to be supportive and overtly encouraging. But I think also if people are not participating, there's normally a reason. And, and sometimes it's because people are, who understand their projects really well aren't always very good at communicating them. Um, the, everything we do um, is anonymous when it involves citizens and young people. But we probably don't talk about it enough, maybe on this panel. but. You know, you need to make efforts within your data collection exercises, if that's what your objective is, to, to get those points across that this is anonymous, it's private, you won't, your name won't be revealed. So I think fear, depending on where you're working, can be a, an important factor of whether people want to get involved or not. I think the second one is, is um, uh, apathy. <laughs> and also, you know, is this something that actually serves, serves a person? And, and that's where the feedback piece comes in. The, where um, we get criticized by some of the traditionalists, um, but where we can really play a strong role is the feedback loop. Because of what technology allows us to do in terms of, even in an anonymous way, uh, track, assign anonymous IDs to people, you can ensure that you're giving them feedback on their contribution later. If something they contributed to, in, in my case, that's generally either answering polls or it's submitting reports of some description on the projects I work on with people in the community, then you need to make sure you're sharing the results. And when you don't, uh, you really see a quick drop off of the participation. So we know that, um, we know that that's a factor. Um, and then I think um, finally is um, the one thing that we haven't really understood so well in the research honestly, is exactly who we are and the limitations of our access. The amount of time I've, I've heard people say, well, people can't, uh, people don't own a phone, women don't own phones, and um, I was just reading some research this morning that came out of South Africa, and for eight to 13 year olds, phone ownership was in the 30s percent, which is like super high, by the way, it's on a trajectory like this. Um, but 89% had accessed a phone within the last four weeks. So that really made my head spin, thinking, well, the potential is actually much greater than I'd realized, uh, not just today, but in the future, which is my final point, which is um, we have a habit, especially when you're coming from a traditional research background of looking at things today and how they were in the past in your research window. Um, and I think it's people in this room are probably trying to anticipate more what's going to be happening tomorrow and for the next few years in terms of interaction. So even if you're being criticized for investing in that now, um, what you'll probably find is that it's worth the investment in probably you know, 12 to 24 months time frame, and it's wor worth the risk of failing because of that. Does anyone else have any comments on the, uh, is it morally right to nudge users? I don't know why it made me think of Facebook, um, <laughs> but I, I think it's a, um, it's a thin line, I guess, between how you actually are accountable to that person that you know you're journeying them through something, as opposed to I, I'll use again Facebook as the example of how they did all these studies and tweaked with people's timelines without actually informing them. So it's all about those. I guess we have more practices not to follow. <laughs> and roadmaps to follow. But um, it's, I think it's a useful exercise in better understanding user design, as you were saying, because um, maybe for me, logically, when I go to my society or whatever particular platform within my society, I just want to go to X. There's a template, I just press and send. But maybe when I get there, I'm just finding a site navigator or that kind of thing. So it does help understand, but I think it's all about how do you better make sure that this person 
um, is not being forced into using the site in a way they didn't actually plan to do that. Because the other thing, even as we talk a lot about participatory design and uh, the use of participatory, I'm seeing a lot of research coming from academics saying that even that whole approach is a bit problematic in the sense that even when we set up, say, ra uh, uh, round tables or town halls, it's still about the loudest people, um, the most vocal. So we tend to also discredit silent participation. And that can also, I guess, replicate in this case with the site. And so if somebody is just staying there and maybe observing, maybe that's fine too. It's at the end of the day, whatever it is, it's not, they're not punished in their use or um, accessibility of a particular site because of how they choose to go about it. Much in the same way that in a room like this, if we were supposed to be having a consultative session and I was just not feeling comfortable to talk and keep raising my hand to speak, my participation should not be discounted. So these are just some of the things we always have to keep in mind. Any comments from this side? Okay. Maybe just one, because I, I totally agree with what you say. Um, I think there is a, a big um, challenge uh, concerning uh, how we feel legitimate to participate on something. And uh, maybe it is a question uh, with uh, uh, meetings and roundtable, but it is also a question on platform, online platform, and we don't have to um, not take into account this uh, this challenge uh, when you when we think about uh, designing an uh, online tool. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? I don't want to keep going back there. Okay, Kareel. Um, oh, you've got the microphone. Seeing gaps, so there was a um, statement just that you know that um, you can see gaps in your data. So one of the problems that I've noticed um, for us as civic tech organizations in terms of you know where we prioritize our projects, um, going down to communities quite often is too difficult, um, or we don't have that much resources. Um, but what I like to um, know is that at the international level, quite often we're dependent, you know, when we do our proposals or to see priorities. We're actually looking at international indicators or national indicators like ITU, mobile penetration rates and all these things. Um, and I've found that they don't go into enough details <laughs> in terms like, okay, uh, mobile penetration rate is 120%. Yes, because everybody in the city has four phones in the family, right? Um, so uh, what I'd like to ask the panelists is that have you seen a push uh, at the international level or even at the national level to provide better indicators um, rather than these big wholesale numbers for us to actually use so that the gaps are actually more meaningful uh, rather than these nice looking numbers of 150% <laughs> mobile penetration rate. Thank you. Who would you like to take that? That's a really good point and um, I'll answer it based on two two hats of one. So when I used to work at one of the hubs that was being mentioned earlier, that was exactly what we tried to do. We'd get all these numbers about pen penetration rates, but we wanted to truly understand when you go to a community of farmers, what does that actually mean in terms of daily used experiences and that kind of thing? So really filling the gap in qualitative research that would try and feed back to the community of technologists. And so uh, the, the long and short of that is the civic tech community has to understand and actually also drive demand for more qualitative research. That way you're not moving in isolation. You're speaking to the fact that um, other organizations need to step up and actually quantify or better qualify this research that we're getting, the big macro data. On the international level, I'll speak from my organization and what we've been trying to do is actually working very directly with the ITU themselves to actually better update these indicators because, again, they have to have a gendered perspective. And by gendered, I just mean that it's not just the male-female binary, but better understanding communities at different income levels, uh, socioeconomic levels, you know, all these identities. How do we be make that better um, shown and reflected in these indicators? Now, of course, you can imagine that that will take years in negotiations and back and forth. But what has happened in the interim is just trying to do more research. So, for instance, with the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which is one of the coalitions around which we drive broadband policy reform. We try and really get into the nuances of what it means for mobile phones and internet bundles to be accessible and affordable and meaningful use of that. We've also done research with Lisa and others um, around how women in 10 urban poor communities actually access and use the web. So really trying to fill in that gap. So the long and short of it is we don't, 
movements need to be in, in sync. We need to also work with traditional NGOs who have been mobilizing in communities for years. So how do we get to know who they are so that if you just need to deploy, you're able to and you're working with people who are trusted? How do we make sure researchers like myself are, or my organization are working in tandem with you guys? So it's a, and that's why moments like this are really important to understand that we're not, you know, civic tech is not unique in the challenges they face, but we need to also from time to time come together and push for this stuff with the bigger sort of like more resourced and bigger entities that should be driving how these things are better understood. So yes, there is work around that. It's slow paced, it's glacial, but we're trying. <laughs> I've got a slightly um, different response. It, within, within UNICEF, I think, within the Office of Innovation, we've kind of recognized that taking local tech projects and holding them to account through traditional frameworks that we've used for projects for 30 years probably shouldn't apply. So what we've tried to do um, is rip up that rule book as of about a year ago. And um, we've put together something called the UNICEF Innovation Fund, um, where there's a different set of criteria. You won't be asked for those kind of indicators in applying for that fund. You can get grants between 50 and $150,000. Um, and it's more of a venture approach. Um, we're working with donors who are having us manage that fund that are open to failure and talking about it. Um, in fact, uh, if one in 10 of the things we fund works for children um, and it's something we can scale up in the future, then we've worked out that's worth the investment, so which means there's a lot of scope. So I think that part of it is those indicators are all about making people feel comfortable about the amount of risk they're taking. People just need to be comfortable about the risk they're taking. It's not necessarily your responsibility to make me feel more comfortable. I should be able and prepared to take more risk. And I think that you know donors are starting to move in that direction. GSMA have an innovation fund now, which is quite similar. I think that ITU might even be working with them on it. Um, UNHCR have done something quite similar recently as well. So a lot of these UN agencies are trying to kind of catch up with you guys. Um, in, in France, we, we launch uh, a lab which, uh, which aims at uh, deepening our collective understanding of uh, digital uh, empowerment. And uh, we, we participate to um, um, an international survey which is called World Internet Project, which uh, mixed um, policymaker and uh, universities, academics. Uh, and it's... it's um, it's uh, qualitative and quantitative studies on uh, empowerment, such as uh, social op openness with, uh, with the internet, uh, knowledge access, and there, there are results. Uh, uh, the results were published uh, in, in this summer, I think, in, in Moscow, there was a, a summit. And uh, I, I, I think that there, is, there are uh, approximately uh, 13 countries uh, countries in the in this uh, this project, so um, we we use the, the, the um, we we try to uh, collect uh, data because uh, we we totally agree with your your position. We, we need uh, civic tech activists need uh, to have um, uh, data, and and as far as we are concerned, we we think that it's our uh, role to uh, give uh, to to fund uh, a survey and to give. Uh, uh, to give uh, uh, initiative uh, this this data, so yes, you, I, I know that. <laughs> and uh, in France, we have uh, our our lab, lab is uh, is really um, working on a geo geographical uh, uh, gap, uh, income gap, gender gap. Um, so this is like uh, efficient and uh, useful uh, data. Um, uh, recently, um, we, we, we tried to develop an index on open e-governance and we looked into five dimensions because we want to collect indicators that could help um, government technologies, etc. So we looked into meshed e-governance, uh, e-participation, um, digital inclusion, the use of ICT by civil society, the open and legal policy systems. So we, we were looking mostly at 
at policies, but at the same time, we were looking at available services of government, what is there. Unfortunately, this research is just um, uh, limited to five countries, and this is something that we want to expand. We are, um, we are trying to evolve this index, and, and we're learning a lot from it, actually. Since we're looking into policies, we, we know that we should also look into how policies are being implemented, because that is very important. Anyway, based on, on the little data that we have on the, uh, the index that we developed, we're, we're also, we, we, we want to see that based on, on, on the findings of the five countries that were involved, there are already indicators that there are gaps, that they can still push their governments to uh, come up with policies that would be helpful because they are uh, missing or, or they are not being implemented. And then what about um, civil society tech companies? What are those technologies that could help um, citizens to engage more their governments? Okay, thank you. Is there any more questions from the audience? We've got 10 minutes. Okay, there's someone at the back there. Yeah. Um, I think this session asked the right question, which is what are the practical checklists uh, from the practitioners so that civic tech tools can actually genuinely uh, benefit communities. Let me expand this question a bit more uh, in the current context of disinformation or fake news. Um, how can civic tech uh, use tools to genuinely provide genuine news in information to actually benefit communities. The context of my question is actually based on the recent report from Oxford University. Uh, it's called Troops, Trolls, and Troublemakers, a Global Inventory of Organized Social Media Manipulation, which looks at how governments themselves, and even the political parties, have used cyber troops to manipulate public opinion. And I think we're seeing this becoming more pervasive, not just in the Philippines, the rest of uh, Asian countries, especially when there is a massive uh, disgust over government uh, decisions on important policy matters. And certainly, fake news uh, using troops provide fake information that do not genuinely benefit communities. So in the context of this discussion, what are some of the practical solutions or suggestions that civic tech community that you think could offer to combat this uh, phenomena. Thanks. Can you volunteer for that one? That's a really good question. Um, and the thing that jumped to mind when you asked it is that in about less than five years, communities online will be yearning for alternatives to Facebook and Twitter and all these popular sites, simply because it's just becoming, I guess the gift and the curse of the network effect is how do you actually weed out some of this stuff? Now, I think personally that this gives um, an opportunity for those building civic tech tools to actually learn one from the mistakes that some of these platforms have done and especially a platform like Twitter that's sort of reluctantly just been growing and so much in the, ha having so much of a lag in better fixing for the platform that it could be so what demand has signaled is not necessarily what they've supplied and that kind of platform is what I think has been um, a good way for us to understand what civic tech and civic engagement looks like on, online. Now, in terms of how you could better design platforms for engagement, I think those are lessons you can learn almost in a sense of what not to do. Um, but at the same time, what to do is how do you actually make these platforms that you may be building as civic tech folks be the sites that even the people we want to hold to account come to engage with us on? And that ne doesn't necessarily uh, lie in the tech itself, but it means in those cultiv cultivating those relationships so that if it's, um, I don't know, a minister who's supposed to be accounting for something, this is the site, they come to your site, for instance, to actually engage communities, and there are clear rules of engagement that are being built upon. And I've seen a lot of that kind of work starting to happen. And I, it, again, the word elitist will be used. There's a lot of criteria being introduced into how people can engage in particular sites as a vetting mechanism. So it's almost like you, not just any bot or troll can be deployed. But so I think there's a bit of the um, analog in terms of cultivating relationships where if I really, really want to talk to somebody who holds power or is somebody who should be accountable, you make your site strategically the place where people can come and engage with them. But at the same time, the, there are certain checks and measures to who, not necessarily who, but how you engage that are adhered to maybe from the get-go. Those are, those are interesting experiments and over time, I think they'll start to gain traction. It is an excellent question. Um, I think that um, bad news travels pretty fast, whether it's fake or not. 
and that 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 can be a real problem in itself. I mean, from a UNICEF perspective, we're really focusing on development, uh, health, education, um, and protection of children. Uh, in the Ebola outbreak, um, uh, a couple of years ago, one of the we were using a, a tool that enabled us um, Rapid Pro software. Yeah, it's open source. We used it to enable us to ask people um, in Sierra Leone if um, they'd seen community health workers there lately, um, and they'd just simply say yes or no, we mapped those results, and we used it to measure high levels and low levels of visibility of these community health workers who are giving out critical information about safe burial, um, how to try and prevent yourself from Ebola, not to touch corpses, and so on. So where there was a low level of visibility, we were redirecting them. While all this was happening, um, a couple of uh, cases popped up in uh, Nigeria. Um, and social media, um, had a, which is, had a pretty decent penetration at the time, um, a rumor went round that um, salt was um, a cure for Ebola, and it just took off. Um, and the price of salt went through the roof. Um, people were bathing in it, and a couple of people even died. And, you know, the, it shows you, like, the, the power of how quickly something like this can spread. Um, this organization called Internews, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with them, um, they do some really good work on uh, trying to set the record straight on more accurate sources of information. They had this idea to plug into our systems, and what they would start doing would be debunking rumors one-on-one. -on -one. So... They were able to say, right, tell us all of the rumors you're hearing in your community about Ebola. And every rumor they got, they debunked, like one-on-one, -on -one, they replied. We just gave them access to be able to do it. And then the second thing they did was they went on the radio, they set up radio shows, and they went everywhere saying, right, these are the rumors and they're not true. Right? These are the, and this is what the truth actually is. Um, so I think that when, I think there's another important ingredient in here. The reason that that, rumor took off um, so quickly was because of a lack of information in the first place. There was a vacuum and there was a demand because people was terrified. Um, and there were, weren't any great answers either. Um, and so that, when, when people really have a demand for information and no one fills that vacuum, then something will eventually fill that vacuum. And I think that fanned the flames of it as well. So my lesson for that is that it's also incumbent upon us to try and get accurate information, especially when it comes to health education, things that we know about, get it out there as quick as possible, which again is where technology has an obvious role to play. Do you guys have any thoughts on this question? Um, definitely, um, you have a lot of trolls you have a lot of misinformation and this disinformation. Uh, you're from the Philippines? Yes, so you would know about that. And it's, um, sometimes it's even um, government officials or those employed in government who are spreading the misinformation and disinformation in my country, in our country. Yeah, so that's re a real problem in our case. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of reports, actually. We have partners from women's organizations who report to us about cases of online harassment that they get. Uh, they even get uh, threats, uh, threats of being raped, uh, of being killed just for saying something which is against, um, let's say, the pronouncement of, of the administration. So sometimes if you engage them, them there's healthy discussion, but sometimes it gets too much and... Uh, you, you may even get sick. It, it's too stressful. Um, there's one um, organization, uh, they're journalists actually, uh, the National J Union of Journalists of the Philippines. They developed an app uh, on uh, fact-checking, how to spot um, fake news. So you report that. And, and sometimes it, it does help. But of course, um, we, um, they also tell people not to spread fake news themselves. I mean, this information and this. Right, um, I think we've got time for one more question, if there is a question out there. No? Okay, have I seen everyone? Right, well, we've only got uh, one minute left. Um, so, yeah, let's wrap up. Thank you very much, panellists. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah.